Good evening. Good evening. All right, one person. Great evening. Hey! hey. Great. All right. Woo. We got a great crowd in here. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had an instance in your life where you felt like you were supposed to do something? You were supposed to go somewhere. You, you, you felt that maybe as a Christian, God's called you to go somewhere to do something that was that was going to stretch you, something that was hard. Maybe you're going to talk to somebody who, who was difficult. Maybe you um, needed to give a different, a difficult message. Uh, maybe even uh, you've messed up and you, you needed to kind of tuck your tail and go talk to someone and, and admit that you were wrong. And then you fail to do it. Mm. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Yeah, the truth is that each one of us, in some way, shape, or form, has been negligent of what God has called us to. And so the title of tonight's sermon is Jonah 3, The Depths of God's Grace. It's the name of the sermon series. Couldn't think of anything better. As we think about this particular passage tonight from Jonah chapter 3, as we study the depths of God's grace, we'll see how God can overcome our shortfalls. How God can speak through people who are disobedient. How He can give second chances. How He can redeem a people who are very wicked and astray from Him. And how He does it through a simple and sufficient word. So if you guys would, if you guys would stand with me, we're going to read Jonah chapter 3 together. And the standing is just symbolic as we honor the reading of God's word. In verse 1 it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the simplicity and the sufficiency of your word, which does the work through your spirit. God, I pray tonight that the message would be clear, that the message would be simple, and that it would be sufficient for your church to be equipped to love one another and to love you. And for those who are, who are not part of the family of God, Father, that you would use your word to draw them through your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So just to give you guys an overview, if, you, if you've never read the book of Jonah and you've missed the past couple of sermons, um, in chapter 1, the story starts off very similar to this chapter. Uh, the word of God goes to Jonah, and God calls for Jonah to go out to Nineveh, this, this great and and fierce and nasty city of Assyrians that were very barbaric and the most violent people probably that have ever existed throughout civilization. And God calls Jonah to go and preach to them that if they don't turn from their ways that God will bring his wrath and he'll bring disaster to them. And so Jonah being a, a prophet, a man of God, he turns and runs the other way. And so he jumps on a ship to go to Tarshish, which is very far from where he was supposed to go, in the opposite direction. And as he gets on the ship, a great storm comes. God sends a great uh, uh, torrential downpour, a hurricane-esque type storm. The ship starts to, 
to bend and, and, and break, and the crew starts freaking out, and they discover that it's Jonah, it's Jonah's fault. And Jonah confesses to them, it's my fault that I brought this on you guys. The best remedy is they try to throw cargo, cargo over, the best remedy would be to throw Jonah over. So he admits it's his fault and asks to be thrown over, wishing death upon himself, essentially being thrown into the ocean. And so as Jonah hits the water, the storm calms, and Jonah's body begins to perish to the bottom of the sea, only to be scooped up and swallowed by a giant fish. And then we read last week, Pastor Rick did a great job of showing us that, that the rebel Jonah now has reached a moment of, uh, of a pit. He's reached a, 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 a valley moment in his life, and he's crying out to God for forgiveness. And then at the end of chapter 2, uh, verse number 10, it says, The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So the first point here of this sermon tonight is the depths of God's grace, God's grace to the rebel. And the rebel we're going to talk about is Jonah. And so when we think about Jonah, we were speaking earlier in our men's study today about the holiness of God. We live in a new covenant time where, where grace has been given. Jesus Christ has came. He's lived perfectly on our behalf. So we experience grace. One thing that the church is missing out many times is the holiness of God. Sometimes when people are preaching holiness, we say that's legalism. And it's actually know that God is a holy God and he's just. And, he, and, and we all deserve his wrath. And so Jonah being this prophet who was in this relationship with God, who was speaking to him. Um, he had already done mighty works on behalf of Jonah. Uh, he, God's calling him to do something else. And Jonah's response is absolute disobedience. And so we saw, we saw men who, when the ark was slipping... The Ark of the Covenant was slipping in travel, that they went to touch it, to steady it, and they were struck dead. And this is the holiness of God. And so when we read the story, uh, this isn't just some uh, children's story that we, we fantasize about. This is a, a disobedient prophet who really deserved the wrath of God. He really deserved to be struck down for his disobedience. But what did God do? In God's grace and his kindness, he did the unthinkable. He sent a giant fish to swallow up this man and to hold him in a, in a holding pattern for three days. So Jonah, Jonah experienced God's grace, but Jonah was humbled along the way. So church, one thing I want to is I want to exhort you guys too is that the scripture teaches that God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. It says the scripture teaches he opposes the proud. And so, when Jonah was being proud, God was opposing him by sending a storm. And in Jonah's plight to death, he was essentially asking for them to kill him. He, he, was, he reached his low point, and that's when he received the grace of God. And, and we, as the, the 21st century church, we love to talk about grace, we love to talk about blessings. But let me tell you what the grace of God looked like in this man's life. Any fishermen in the room? got one. There's only one. Okay, two. Okay, there's three. There's a couple closet fishermen. I know you guys are in here. Don't have to be embarrassed. There's nothing wrong with being a fisherman. I was talking to a fisherman friend of mine yesterday. We were talking about this story. And I was talking about what it must have been like to be Jonah trapped inside the stomach of a fish. And he started saying, have you ever cut a fish open? Man, I just, I haven't. I'm not an outdoors man. I'd like to be. So, you know, you guys do fish. Bring me next time. But he was telling me that he said, when you cut a fish open, you can see everything they've eaten. And he said, it's not pretty. He said that you can see, like, he would go to the ocean and he'd, he'd catch these big fish. And he'd cut them open because he's going to eat them later on. And he would see these other fish or crustaceans or things. And what happens is the stomach acid in the, the fish would start to turn these, these vibrant, colorful creatures into this opaque, milky, I don't even know what color you would describe them. But they, it just started to lose their color. And he said, not only the way that they looked, he said, but the smell is awful. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Fishermen? <laughs> so this, this was Jonah's being spit up on the shore after being inside the belly of this fish for three days. Now, I will say this. We don't know for sure if Jonah died or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's supernatural either way. 
Either Jonah lived for three days in the belly of a fish, which is amazing and only God can do that. Or Jonah died in the fish and was spit up on the land, which is amazing and only God can do that. But chapter 2 says when he's crying out to Sheol, his soul had entered into the, the pits. This is, this is usually a, a description of death. Uh, it could be poetic. So I don't know. There's, there's a lot of distinction that people are making between that. I'm saying either way it doesn't matter because it's a supernatural act. That a man could be in the belly of a fish and be spit up on the shore. So when he was spit up on the shore, this man who had spent three days in a fish would have come out looking almost like the walking dead. His skin would have been just, what did say? Torn. 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 Bleached. I mean, he, not only did he look bad, but he probably smelled really bad. Right? Uh, this is a very humbling experience. And so my, my encouragement to you guys, church, it's hard for us to naturally humble ourselves. But I would, I would encourage you to make every effort to do that. Because when we don't humble ourselves, God will, he will do it. But the beauty of it is that in, jo in Jonah's humility, he experienced God's grace. Another thing that was beautiful that we sometimes gloss over in this story is that Jonah had never escaped the presence of God. And so that should encourage, encourage us, church, that while we're struggling or, or going through life and, and, and things seem to get out of hand, that we never escaped the presence of God. God was with him. And the other thing which is crazy about this second chance that God was given the rebel Jonah, um, I did some studies this week. And I want to try to draw for you guys on this board. I know we've never done this before. But I want to try to draw for you guys um, just the layout of the land. And this might be disastrous. So, it was... Actually, I'll just tell you. Because it, it would take me too long to draw. and probably wouldn't look better anyways. So, where Jonah was, where Jonah originally started... Some of you guys are disappointed. You're like, let me see what you're going to draw. Um... Next time I'll just put the map on the screen. So Jonah, when he started out, he was, he was on the coast, like the Israel type area. And Nineveh, this is a piece of land right here. Nineveh was basically on the other side of the land. It was 500 miles from where he was, he was going. God, God called him to go 500 miles. And Jonah desired to go 2,500 miles to Tarshish. Tarshish. So what they said would have taken him 30 days by land, 30 days by foot or donkey, it would have taken him 30 days to get from his original destination to Nineveh. He made it in four days. And so what happened was he went on the boat, went down, and then spent three days later. So God actually shortened his trip. So it would have taken him 30 days. And it's a fun, interesting fact, but God did it in four days. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I'm glad I didn't spend five minutes trying to draw it and then... <laughs> But I thought it was really cool when I was studying it. Uh, because even in his disobedience, God, was, God had a better plan. And so church, tonight, before I get past this point, I want to ask you guys, what, what are you leaving on the table? What area of your life have you kind of just dismissed as, ah, you know, it's too hard, or that person's too far from the Lord, or, hey, this relationship's too broken, or, man, I've, I've got this stuff in my past, these wounds that hurt so much. What area of your life have you just kind of left on the table? It's on the back burner, so to speak. And you say, oh, not today. I, I just, I don't know how I'm going to get to that. What area are you holding on to? What area of disobedience are you leaving on the table? Because I believe as God was giving Jonah a second chance in the story, he's always giving us a second chance. We always have a second chance until we go to be with the Lord. And what you do with this chance, what you do with this opportunity, could mean life and death for those who God's calling you to reach. Yeah. I know we all got people in our life that are hard to reach. We all got people like the Ninevites that we, we think there's no, man, they, they're too far. That's, that's who I was. That's the kind of guy I was. And the Lord saved me. And so he can continue his work, but he uses us to do it. So just like God gives Jonah the second chance, I want to exhort you guys, encourage you guys today to take the second chance God may be offering you. And how do we do it? Leads me to my second point. Verse 1, it says, The Word. Does everybody say the word? The word. The word. The word. 
word. The word of the Lord. The one it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. God spoke to him and told him to do what? To go and speak what? The word of the Lord. Now here it's eight words. In verse number four, it says Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, "Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown." But the Hebrew is actually five words. And I don't have the Hebrew words with me, but it was five words. That, he, that, that Jonah was speaking over and over and over again. But essentially the word was, the wrath of God is coming, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, repent. You guys are wicked, rebellious people, repent. Do we like to do that? Is that, is that the message that we like to, to preach? I don't. I mean, you know, that's not, that's not my lead in when I meet people for the first time. Hey, hey, hey dude, I don't know anything about you, but you need to repent the kingdom of God's at hand. But this is the message that he preached. And he did it in this great city. When they say great, they're not talking about this awesome city where it's all, you know, gumdrops and jelly beans. This was a great city in size. It took him three days from the edge of the city to the edge of the city. And he went through the crowds of people, telling them all, in 40 days, God's going to destroy this city over and over and over again for three days. I've never seen the movie uh, The Greatest Showman. Am I even saying that right? Showman. The Greatest Showman. Uh, apparently it's a great movie. My friend Andrew's trying to get me to watch it. Some of you guys like the movie. I've never seen it. And what I understand about this movie is that Hugh Jackman plays the role of P.T. Barnum. Am I right? And what he does is he, he's putting on this big circus. He's putting on this big show. So he's got like the outfit, he's got the music, he's got the animals, he's got the lights, he's got the stage, he's got the seats, he's got the, the, all the, uh, the tent, I mean, he's got all this stuff, right? So he can present this great show. That's what makes him a showman. But I want to contrast that with our brother Jonah. Jonah was a zombie looking guy who smelled like rotten fish. So what power, what, what showmanship did he have? None. What did he have? What was, what was his weapon? The word of God. Well, surely then, if he was speaking the word of God, he was, he was presenting the love of God and talking about the gracious benefits of being part of God's kingdom. He, he was using all the coffee cup verses we use. I can do all things through Christ. He was, you know, all these wonderful things. The Lord is my shepherd. Great verses. I love them. So surely it was a flattering message. It was, it was it. He said, this city will be destroyed in 40 days unless you repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. The wrath of God is upon you. Repent. Okay, so he's not the greatest showman. He doesn't have the most flattering message. But what happens? The word does the work. He's trusting in the word to do the work. It took him. He heard, so he heard the word in chapter 1. He ran away from God. He experienced a storm. That, I mean, I feel like that would have been enough for me to say, all right, God, I'm going to obey you. Ship's falling apart. He says, throw me over. He had to get super humble before he realized the power of God's word. It's all he had left. So my question for us, we desire to see people saved, right? Do we? I mean, search your heart. Do we actually desire to see people saved? If so, what are we relying on? When, when you share the gospel with people and, and you desire to see people saved, what are you relying on? Are you desiring to build a great relationship? Uh, maybe you guys have particular hobbies. You, you like to drink coffee. You, you, uh, you mountain climb. Like We're building this great relationship. Are you relying upon the relationship? Are you, are you relying upon the, the, the similarities? Maybe you're really good at apologetics. Apologetics is when you can 
You can give a presuppositional or evidential defense of the Bible and God's Word. We can prove that, that Noah's Ark was at Mount Ararat. We know where that is. And we've, we've, we've x-rayed the ground and look at all this evidence. Is that what we're relying upon? That stuff's good, right? Stuff strengthens our faith. But is that what we're relying upon? Hey, you know what? I'm just going to let them see the good in me. I'm going to mow his lawn. I'm going to help him move. That's the stuff I used to say before I was a Christian. I'm going to do a bunch of good stuff. That's how I'm going to be a good person. Now listen. Hear me out, church. If we are Christians, we ought to be doing good things. I'm not telling you not to do that. But as you mowing their lawn or you washing their car or you helping them move, going to bring them to salvation? No. It can help. It's an aid. People are saved by the word of God alone. We just got through going through Romans. How will they know unless they're sent? How will they be, you know, how will they know unless they hear about Jesus Christ? Every person in this room who has been born again, at some point you heard the good news. And guess what? You don't have good news without bad news. Jonah's preaching the bad news. Isn't he? Do you think these murderous people who went around uh, skinning people and decapitating people do you think they knew they were like bad people? Yeah. I think so. But they became accustomed to it. John 15, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, his job is to convict of what? Sin. And so unless people know that they're sinners, they'll never want a Savior. If we're starting, if this, the, the beginning part of our message is, hey man, uh, you're, you're good. God loves you, man. I mean, I'll accept that. That's, when I wasn't a Christian, I was like, hey, that's good news. My buddy that I was sitting at the bar with on Saturday night, see, that's the kind of stuff he'd tell me. Hey, dude, Jesus died for our sin. Order another shot. That's what I believed. But it wasn't until someone brought to me the bad news that I was a sinner who was deserving of the wrath of God. I had a Jonah in my life preach to me a hard message, but he offered me grace. He said, listen, it's not just that you deserve the wrath of God, which you do, but God's freely offering you grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. How is this accomplished, church? Through the Word. We're going back to the Word, man. We can't get away from this thing. This is the foundation for the Christian life. I read two quotes today from my, my brother Dustin Siegert's quote, them, but uh, two great men of God that I want to quote here. George Whitfield, he says... My mind being now more open and enlarged, I began to read the Holy Scriptures upon my knees, laying aside all other books and praying over, if possible, every line and word. This proved food indeed and drink indeed to my soul. I daily received fresh life, light, and power from above. I got more true knowledge from reading the book of God in one month than I could have ever acquired from all other writings of men. George Whitfield. One of the most amazing preachers in the history of time. Another man I greatly admire, George Mueller. If you don't know about George Mueller, get, get your learn on. George Mueller's the real deal. When you study George Mueller, your faith will increase or you'll be convicted. George Mueller says, I went to my room and locked the door. And putting the Bible on a chair, I went down on my knees at the chair. There I remained for several hours in prayer and meditation over the Word of God. And I can tell you that I learned more in those three hours which I spent this way than I learned for many months previously. Church, do you know where the power is from? Do you really know? I can give you lip service and say, yeah, amen. I got a confession to make. I uh, I had I had about seven seven days where I just kind of 
felt like I was getting like this. And finally, I reached a, a tipping point last Sunday night where I was just man, kind of like asking myself, is all this worth it? I just hit a, I just hit a wall. I can't explain it. There's no real vents. I didn't have any, you know, great tragedies in my life. You know, I've got, I've got a wonderful life, uh, wonderful wife and children. All, all this, I love the church. It, was, it wasn't anything like that. And we were doing this thing called the Discipleship Journal Reading Plan. You guys heard of that? Hmm. And uh, I looked on there on Monday and said, I'm seven days behind. So there's a direct correlation. Now, I'm telling you, I was spending time in God's Word, but I wasn't spending time in God's Word for myself. I wasn't doing what Mueller and Whitfield were talking about, devouring, feasting, meditating. This was, a, this was something I was using to study. This was a tool for my job. So I was in the Word, right? The Bible was open. The discipleship journal plan was, or the Bible app was open. But I wasn't reading the Word for myself, for dedication. I was doing it for delivery. And so church, if we're going to be effective people of God in this culture, we don't need to be the greatest showmen. I mean, look around. You know, we, we don't have a uh, we don't have a, a blanket on this table over here. This is a behind the scenes. We're, this is a church plan, right? This isn't the most attractive ministry in town. I get it. But if we're people who are dedicated and humble ourselves and seek God's word, God will use us in mighty and profound ways. If you don't know about George Mueller, please go check him out. There's a, there's a documentary called Robber of the Cool Streets. I'm going into great detail about it. But that man, through prayer, meditating on the Word, has done more for, for Christianity in the last two centuries than probably millions of folks. Take a look at him. So the last point here today is from verses 5 through 10. As this rebellious prophet who'd been given a second chance, he went out in his uh, fish smelliness, and he walked the streets. He preached God's word. There was a greater miracle that happened than even a man surviving the belly of fish for three days. The greatest miracle that happens in this book is that this entire city repents of their sin. I mean, we can, you know, we can naturally explain. I mean, I don't. I don't know the fish story that well as far as having you know watched the History Channel and done all this research and all these animated things to see could a person actually survive. I mean, I'm sure that naturally that could happen and that would be amazing either way. But what's more amazing than that is that someone could be brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. The Bible teaches that if one sinner repents, the entire heaven, the, 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 the host of angels rejoices. And we're talking about a whole city. That's crazy. We live in a, we talk about all the time, our culture is horrible, and we're going downhill, and, 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 and rightly so, things like abortion and, and sex, slavery, and all this stuff going on, that stuff needs to be condemned. But man, we don't live in Nineveh. If the power of God can work through a, a rebellious prophet, with the unflattering speech and smell and appearance and that, that, that God can use that to bring an entire city on its knees. He can, he can use us here in Charlotte, can he? Yeah. This is the Bible, though. People have a foundation of this stuff. We need to call them to repentance. Look what happens here. It's beautiful. It says the king, right? So here's, here's a, a cool thing our brother Levi was talking about earlier. You know, we talk about wicked governments, and a lot of times uh, we think that by voting for the right people, um, that everything's going to change. Right? I'm not, not, this isn't an anti-voting sermon. Right? You should vote. Do your due diligence. 
search the issues, vote for the right guys. But it's not going to change by putting the right people in office. Okay, church? What's going to change is when the church goes out and preaches the good news. Do you think that Jonah had a uh, seat? Do you think the king would see this disgusting dude? They probably, I mean, they would probably keep him far away from the king. But as Jonah is intermingling with the city, and the word of God's going forth, and repentance is falling all over these people, what happens? It goes from the bottom up to the top. The word reached the king, it says in verse 6. And he arose from his throne, he removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. This is a sign of repentance. Sitting in ashes would have been like, hey, I'm really repenting. Because it's one thing to change your wardrobe. It's another thing to sit in ashes. I love what the king decrees here. He's the king of this great kingdom of barbarians who were, were based upon money. They were conquering people. They had spoils and riches and animals. And what does he do? He issues a decree, not just for the people, but also for who? The animals. I don't even have an animal. My man Lucas has three cats. And if you're going to fast, and you're saying, my, also, my cats are going to fast. Some of y'all have dogs. These dogs are going to fast. But this meant more to him because this was his livelihood. These weren't his pets. He said, this thing is, our sin is so offensive to God that not only are we going to repent, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to fast and not even our animals are going to eat. And you know what happens to fasting animals? They die. You know what happens to dead animals? You can't eat them? Well, maybe you could. But you can't sell them. You can't make money off of them. And that's what they were all about. This whole nation was about greed. And who was the top dog? Sound familiar? But why does he do that? He does that in hopes that God would relent. God wouldn't destroy his city. Now these, these verses can be confusing. There's uh, Joel 2, Jeremiah 18, where it talks about God relenting. God doesn't change his mind. Okay? I want to make sure that we establish that right here. God's not like sitting back like saying, hey, I wonder what they're going to do. Oh man, they didn't do that. Okay, I'm not going to do that now. There's a doctrine called immutability, which means God doesn't change. And this is good news for the church. If we had a God who was kind of like fickly, like wondering what we're going to do and changing his mind along the way, man, I don't want to serve that God. Because that sounds a lot like me. You know what I mean? And it could even be said 140 years later, he did destroy Nineveh. So at one point, he actually did. But God was showing them mercy. God was showing these rebellious nation of people mercy. These were some bad dudes. God showed them mercy. So the question for us in regards to this point is, do you show mercy? Do you show mercy to your enemies? Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount said, love your enemies. We're going to hear from our sister Hannah tonight, and she's, she's going and loving people who are very unlovable. And many of you in this room have, have exhibited this Christ-like behavior in loving people. You've been a great example to me. You've taught me how to love people who are unlovable. I always bring up our brother Norm. He loved me when I was an unlovable guy. And by God's grace, he rescued me from my sin. And so my question to you tonight is, who is that person in your life who seems unlovable? That may be the very person that God wants to save and he's going to use you to do it. Amen? We gotta get our hands dirty, church. We gotta get our hands dirty. We're not gonna change the culture by legislation. We talked about earlier, we're gonna show a video later on May 5th. There's an opportunity for us to go pray in front of the abortion mill in Charlotte. As the church has showed up at the abortion mill and prayed, the abortions have gone from 50 on Saturday to five. Praise God. We, we can't sit back and just hope that casting a ballot works. God's called us to be active.
Just like Jonah. Got to be in the midst of the people. But the truth is, guys, and the reality is, we all fall short. Daily, I find myself having a hard time loving those who are lovable, showing grace to those who are far from the Lord. I find myself, as I confessed earlier, not depending on God's word, the sufficiency of it, the simplicity of the gospel. I find myself being given second chances and still going to Tarshish. But there's good news. Jesus. Jesus. Yes. The good news is Jesus. Amen. There's some similarities between Jonah and Jesus, but they fall very short. Because Jesus is so much better than Jonah. So much better. Jonah was a rebel to God. Jesus was a rebel to the world. Jesus was a rebel in his culture. He rebelled against sin. He rebelled against the devil. Jesus was an enemy of the world. They hated him. They put him to death. The devil tried to tempt him three times. Jesus opposed him. Jesus is the word. Second point was that God's word is sufficient. Jesus Christ is sufficient. Look no further. You found him. If you came in here tonight, you're, you're heavy laden. You've got some issues going on. i got good news for you. Jesus. He's sufficient. You know why? Because he was perfect. He's the only one who never needed to repent. Perfect. Our Savior, perfect. Our Lord, perfect. He loved perfect. He preached perfect. He lived perfect. He healed perfect. Everything He did was perfect. And the good news for us is that He offers Himself freely to us tonight. Whether you're a Christian who's been a Christian for years, Jesus is still good news because you need Him. You need Him as much today as the day you got saved. You'll never stop needing Jesus until you're with Him. I think we'll still have some form of worshipful neediness where we're just looking at Him. He's amazing. We want to look at Him all the time when we're worshiping around the throne. If you're not a Christian, i got good news for you. Jesus. This is the only bowl that we have in our guns. I need to be reminded of that. You need to be reminded of that. Jesus, is, He's everything. There's no other solution. If, if the Word of God, Jesus, can bring a city like Nineveh to its knees, then what are we waiting on? We have the most powerful Word ever. The most powerful weapon. Jesus Christ. The High King. He's our priest. He's our intercessor. He's with us. He doesn't leave us. We run from Him. He's still with us. So, tonight as we, as we end the sermon and we think about taking the Lord's Supper, this is our altar call here at Convergence Church. The Lord's Supper is our altar call. This is our time of decision. We're going we're gonna to open up in a minute and, and Jade's going to explain the Lord's Supper. But this is our time where we make a decision. We are, we are coming before our Lord Jesus Christ in, in, sim, in symbol. And are we going to come to Him with with saying lip service, we're with you, Jesus, but meanwhile we know that our lifestyle is running from Him. If you're not a Christian, what are you waiting on? You waiting for the boat to fall apart? You waiting to get thrown to the bottom of the sea? You waiting for a fish to swallow you up? Jesus already accomplished everything on your behalf. This is your opportunity. This is our opportunity, church. Let's pray. God, what a wonderful opportunity we have as your church. As we look at your word and see that you're a God who 
who give second, third, fourth, fifth chances. You give us opportunity, Father, to repent of our sin daily, moment by moment. You give grace to us as we are, we are the Ninevites. We are those who are at war with you. And you continue to forgive and love us. And God, you gave us your word, which is powerful. It's sufficient. It's all we need. God, just as we committed to reading your word January 1st, I pray that we would be committed with vengeance and vigor and passion like Mueller and Whitfield. That we would read our Bibles on our knees. And we would pray and meditate and hang on every word, seeing what you've spoken to us. And that through the meditation of your word, Father, you would fill us with spiritual guidance and works. Good works. Mission works. Mission, uh, works of love. Works of worship. Father, we want to worship you. We want to worship you with a pure heart. So I pray, Father, forgive us of all the times we've run from you. All the things you've called us to do. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, God, that you would... He would help them get over themselves. That they would humble themselves before you now. And then you would give them another opportunity to go and preach to those who are unlovable. Reach into the pit of fire to help pull out those who are perishing. That you would give them the right word. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is sufficient for salvation. It's your power of God for salvation. Pray you give us that kind of grace, Father. We love you. We thank you for your word. Empower us. In Jesus' name. Amen.